Well, welcome to The Rock Mine. I'm Nick James. Today, I'm joined by Aaron Lee. Aaron is an extremely talented multi-instrumental solo artist, as well as the basis for legendary rock and roll band YNT. Aaron, thanks so much for joining The Rock Mine today. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on, Nick. Yeah, of course. So I'd like to talk to you both about your solo work and now over seven years with Y&T, but I figured we should start it, you know, a little bit closer to the beginning. So um, I'd like to ask, who were your earliest musical influences? Oh, Kiss, man. You know, that was the gateway. I mean, I was into music before Kiss, but it was just a casual listening through my parents, what they were playing on the stereo, you know, Zeppelin, Santana, Boston, uh, Fleetwood Mac, you know, stuff like that. So what I grew up on was the seventies really. And so when I got into kiss is when everything exploded in my head. And then I started going down the rock and roll path and discovering rush iron maiden Saxon, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and Y and T of course, uh, specifically about kiss, what drew you in about them? Uh, were you listening to something in particular? Obviously the look, you know, cause being 10, God, I think I was maybe eight, nine years old, really when I first saw kiss, a picture and of course you know it was it was the the look the makeup and then when i picked up kiss alive 2 i went and pulled weeds in my backyard my mom said go pull weeds for two weeks in the backyard and i'll take you to tower records get whatever record you want and i picked up kiss alive 2 opened up the gatefold and and it was it my world changed so did you stick with kiss into the 80s too were you listening to the non-makeup stuff as well yeah i thought they put out all kinds of great stuff uh non-makeup i mean you know, I was a lifer with Kiss until uh, after, you know, 96, after the, reun the reunion that I luckily got to see with Ace and Peter. Um, but ever since then, you know, it's just been kind of a downward spiral, really, you know, when it comes to Paul's vocals and just the the lineup. And, you know, so, I mean, hey, hey all respect, all due respect to the band Kiss. And I love them. God bless them. But yeah, it was time to hang it up a while back. So you mentioned Paul's vocals and just Kiss's live performance in general. Um, I'd love for you to compare that to y and I saw you guys in the Chance Theater in Poughkeepsie, New York. I don't know if you remember it. In 20, I think it was 2018, 19, and 2020. And you guys just put on a stellar show. Vocals being such a big piece of what makes y and great. How do you do it night after night? Is it just rehearsal before a tour? To be honest, we don't rehearse. Um, you know, there's such a large, vast catalog of y and songs that... Um, you know, like, for instance, this 50th anniversary tour that we're starting this year, um, the band formed in 74. So here we are in 24 and it's been 50 years. Unbelievable um, that Dave Menichetti is still killing it and uh, vocally, guitar playing, everything about it, man. The, the man is uh, he, he is legendary for sure. But um, with the vast catalog, man, you know, to try to rehearse a bunch of stuff, we change songs out, you know, and then we find a groove with what's working with a set. But, uh, you know, we, basically, man, there's only so many minutes in, in a set you can do. You know, let's say we're doing two hours and there's this there's certain songs you have to play. And then you fit in the ones that you really want to bring in and, and feel strong about and fit those in with all the other popular songs. So, I mean, it's a good problem to have when you have that many great songs. Yeah. Um, are there any songs uh, that aren't in the set right now that you'd love to make their way into the set? Yeah, well, I mean, there's always going to be that, that, you know, 20 minutes before we go on. Oh, wait, hold on. What if we do this one? Uh, and then everyone's like, oh, no, stop the press, you know, get the song list back. Let's change it out. Um, you know, right now, what we've got going is working. I'd like to see 21st Century in there uh, again, and we'll probably do that since it is the 50th anniversary. What we're doing is two songs from every record in the Y&T catalog. And... 21st century I saw was thrown around in there. We'll have to see if it makes it. But um, yeah, that's the plan right now. Uh, I started listening, I guess, right around the time that I saw my first Y&T show. And I think Black Tiger was the album that really got me into Y&T. Similar experience for you? Yeah, that was the record for me. I bought it strictly off the album art and took it home. And my mind was blown and showed it to all my friends and you know, we wanted to make a band. So then we started learning Y&T songs and learning, you know, Black Tiger. And, uh, you know, it, it, that when I discovered Black Tiger is like when I discovered Kiss, but in a different way. This was a musical way. 
when I heard the music, it wasn't a look thing. It wasn't uh, the makeup or any of that stuff. It was the music. And um, even more prominently than just the music was Phil Kenmore's bass was in the mix. I could hear what he's playing and it interested me. It, it really got me, you know, to, to look at bass as maybe that, because I was playing guitar um, in, when I was a kid at that time. But there were so many guitar players in our neighborhood as as you could throw a rock today and go, I, I could throw one down my block right now and hit a guitar player. You know, everyone plays guitar. But, um, you know, at that time there in my neighborhood, there was no bass players. And that's how I fell into it. But Phil Kenmore was a main influence for me because I could hear what he was playing. It really inspired me to want to learn bass uh, and learn Y&T songs because the bass lines were cool. And, you know, and then, of course, like I said earlier, then I, that led into Iron Maiden and Steve Harris and Getty Lee from Rush and, you know, Chris Squire from Yes. Or, you know, just I can go down the list. But, uh, you know, Y&T was another one of those just life changing for, for music for me was, you know, I was often running down another path. It's yeah. incredible that I that I ended up in one of my favorite bands. That's yeah, it's such a cool really thing. Incredible. Yeah. I'd love for you to talk more about your early experiences in music. Uh, you joined Y&T in 2016, but I'm, I'm curious as to what you were doing before that time. Well, I was playing in cover bands around town as, you know, I mean, let's face it, in, in this day and age, unless you're a big rock star and you've already got your you know career all set up and all that stuff, I'm a working musician, you know, and so I like to play anyway. I mean, so I'm, I was always constantly playing in cover bands. Of course, I'd have original bands. I had a band called Echo of Souls, which you can find, you know, if you Spotify it or whatever, um, which uh, I was really proud of. We put a record out. And, you know, so I, I was always doing original music, even though I was playing in cover bands, you know, to to be making a living and, you know, just staying, keeping the chops up. And I mean, that's what musicians do. They play. So um, and then recording and recording other bands, things like that. But um yeah, of course, I was doing all the things that all musicians pretty much do before they get a, a decent break of some sort to put you in a better situation to take you to the next bigger situation. And when I um, uh, met Frank Hannon from Tesla um, is when that for me, that sort of door opened, the window opened. And then I was uh, allowed in in the house, so to speak, you know, so I was hanging around with the right people. I was playing in Frank's solo band for a few years. Um, I ended up working for Tesla. Uh, I always say this in interviews, man, as as aspiring musicians or even guys, man. I mean, just don't don't ever think you're above doing something in the music business as in, um, you know, oh, I should be the one on stage. And and, you know, that should be me up there. I did stuff behind the scenes with, with Tesla. I did merch. I sold Tesla T-shirts. I uh, I was Frank's guitar tech for the Def Leppard Sticks tour. Um, you know, so I did those things, but those things is what those things are what got me the gig with Y&T. They were little uh, lily, lily pad jumps as I I would call it, you know, some it one thing leads to another and to another. And if I didn't do those things, I wouldn't have my gig with Y&T because Jill Menachetti, the manager of Y&T, she reached out to me because Y&T needed a guitar tech, a road manager for 30 days, just a part of the tour. And I took the gig. She heard that I did this through uh, Brad Lang, the bass player at the time in Y&T. Brad and I were friends. Brad knew that I worked for Tesla. So he's the one who dropped my name in the hat. Jill Menachetti calls me. I go out, do 30 days with, with Y&T as a road manager, guitar tech, a crew guy. And come home two weeks two or three weeks later i get a, an email asking if i'd be interested in joining the band so that's how that worked <laughs> that's a great story uh very inspiring i'm a musician myself and to hear someone like just making it through making those connections and working behind the scenes which is an interesting job in and of itself that's a really cool story uh i was going to ask you about frank cannon because i know he was featured on your single insanity um as well Keep My Dreams Alive features uh, Joel Hoekstra of Whitesnake. I guess you already touched on your relationship with Frank Hannon, but uh, how'd you meet Joel and how'd that process go for recording? I met Joel. Um, this is a kind of a funny story. So Frank Hannon band was playing on the Monsters of Rock cruise. Frank was on with Tesla, but he had his solo band playing. And so we played in, in a lounge somewhere. 
and we had an all-star jam kind of thing where a bunch of guitar players came up, some singers and stuff, and just having fun on the Monsters of Rock cruise. And um, so this was back when Joel was drinking alcohol, and so was I. I don't drink anymore. But so we were both drunk, but I was playing, and all of a sudden some guy comes up behind me and grabs me around my neck and starts kidney punching me, and he's head banging. He wasn't hitting me really hard, but it was kind of like, what is this guy doing? Get, Hey, where's security? Get this guy off of me, man. Well, no, security never came. He just continued to do what he was doing. I kind of shook him off. I was like, motherfucker, man, what are you doing, dude? Get a grip. That's how I met Joel Hoekstra. So uh, from there, then it just turned into seeing him on the Monsters of Rock cruise every year. And then once I got into Y&T, Y&T went and started doing the cruises with me and the band. Joel already knew that I could play bass, but he asked me to uh, play in his what they call the Bloody Mary Hangover Jam on the Monsters of Rock cruise, which is a really popular, really cool thing that they do on the cruise. Joel always does a great job with this. He gives out free Bloody Marys to the crowd. It's like at 9 a.m. in the morning. So most people are hungover, walking around, stumbling around on the ship, you know, the ones getting their coffee. And then they are like, all right, man free Bloody Marys and some music. So everyone hangs out. It's really cool. So I started playing with Joel the last, I'd say three times I was on the cruise with that situation. So we played together and uh, just became friends. And I reached out to him when I was in the need. I was thinking, you know, I, I was, I already had some other guitar players that I was thinking about, but I, I thought, you know, this particular vibe is a total I want to I want to let someone with the skill level of Joel Hoekstra to take that landscape, that backing track right there and just go wild. Just whatever you're going to do. I'm not going to tell you what to do. And basically, I just sent him the track and he he sent it right back with what he laid down. And and there was no going, hey, can you change this? And it was like, hey, you're done, dude. <laughs> that was great. And I knew that that's how it was going to flow with him. So that's why I wanted him to play on it. Yeah, it's a fantastic single and his guitar playing on it is just awesome. I'd like to ask, you're a multi-instrumentalist and you said before that, you know, there were so many guitarists in the area, so you picked up bass. Um, how does that work when you're uh, in your songwriting process? Do you gravitate towards writing a bass line first, the vocals first, lyrics first, I mean, or a uh, guitar part first? It's usually a guitar or a piano. Once in a while, it can be a bass line or something that'll kick off a riff, but more times than not, it's, you know, I'll have an acoustic guitar sitting around and then I'll just grab it. And, you know, and I always figure if I can make something just with an acoustic guitar sound cool in my head, then I could probably expand on it and give it a little production to it, you know, and, and take it further. And that's usually how it rolls out. And you've and played then, some yeah. acoustic shows too, right? Yeah, yeah. All around where I live here in Rockland, California, um, I do. It's near Sacramento. So to give you a kind of a general... Uh, idea but um there's so many little places around here locally that that i play uh doing solo acoustic um basically covers but i'm throwing in my own stuff here and there once in a while but it's just a lot of fun to do songs that i love all acoustic solo singing it anyway um yeah the the, the whole you know uh starting with with a guitar if i have the the arrangement pretty much built I'll just start up a click track, you know, like yeah, every musician's probably, you know, got a very similar uh, approach, you know, um, lyrics are the hardest thing for me to get lyrics together. I know guys that are brilliant at it and it's, and it's effortless for them to do it. For me, it's a lot of work and, um, but the music part, you know, that's, that's always just kind of a flow, just, you know, being in the right headspace. Uh, I always say when you, when you got the antenna up and you're receiving it, man, just just go do it, get it done, let it flow through you, and let the music take it take it where it wants to go. You know, try not to overthink it too much. But yeah, it's fun, man. It's a fun process. That's why I've been putting out singles since 2020. Um, just you know, if I've got the time to to create, I might as well do it instead of. I mean, I don't know what else to do. I'm a musician. <laughs> I'm supposed to make music. Uh, speaking of acoustic work, um, you appear on 2018's Y&T Acoustic Classics Volume 1. I'd love for you to touch on the experience of re-recording some of these songs like Black Tiger, Rescue Me, and Rock and Roll is Going to Save the World. So that 
uh, acoustic record, I guess I could kind of take credit for it in a sense that I brought it up when we were on tour. Um, I, it must have been in 17. I think that record came out in 18. And I was already, since I was already doing acoustic shows around town, I was really accustomed to that, that kind of uh, uh, taking songs and recreating, not recreating, but just breaking them down to the essence of the song, simplifying things and getting it down to the nuts and bolts that you could play on acoustic. I started throwing this idea around while we were, while we were traveling and it wasn't totally, um, you know, Mr. Manichetti, he, he was kind of on the fence with the whole thing all the way up to the point of us being actually being into the studio and tracking. I mean, and then finally he was like, okay, I hear what's going on here and this is going to work. Um, but I was the one pushing that idea. And of course, uh, our drummer, Mike Vanderheel, you know, he, he was pushing it after the idea was presented. And then pretty soon, you know, John Nyman's in on it. And we were like, come on, man, let's just do it. However it comes out, if it's good or bad, let's just go do it and see how it sounds in the end. And then if it's cool, we'll put it out. So that's what we ended up with. And picking those songs, there's songs that kind of make sense to do acoustic, like Rescue Me, you know, with the the acoustic intro and outro. Um, but if you take a song like Black Tiger and then you cut, you half time the beat, you know, then you're really get in, you're getting into territory of, you know, uh, reimagining, I guess, of, of a song, which was a lot of fun. And um, I think that that's what makes that acoustic record a, a bit special is that these songs were kind of not uh, taken too much away from the original, but just a little tinge of something that you're not used to hearing. So it's a little, you know, there's some interesting things going on in songs that you've heard your whole life if you're a Y&T fan, you know. Yeah, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I re-listened to it. I think two days ago and it starts out with contagious and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I, you'd never think this song would be so good acoustic. You know, it's so highly produced, um, you know, but it's just catchy, great vocals. I mean, you guys really laid it down. So I, I, I really enjoy it and thank you for pushing it because uh, it's a great album. Yeah. And I had the uh, honor of actually mixing it. And uh, so that was cool that I can uh, say at least I played and mixed a Y&T record. That's really um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, did you just learn how to, um, you know, the recording process and production mixing? Did you learn how to do that on your own? Did you take classes somewhere? Well, I was recording. I started recording when I was 13, 13 or 14 years old when I had my little uh, Tascam Port of One cassette uh, recorder, little four track. And that's when I started learning how to record, you know, like thousands of other guys, you know, that can totally identify with that same situation. Um, but of course, you know, when digital stuff started coming around and anyone can, you know, have it on their computer now and just record anywhere, um, there is a learning curve. <laughs> There's a, actually a, quite a learning curve if you want to really try to um, release stuff into the marketplace that can hold up next to, you know, pro sounding stuff. Um, I never took classes. I just... Look, here, here's for me, it's not the gear, it's the ear. I've always believed that you can have racks full of the most expensive, coolest stuff, high end, everything, world class studio. But if you don't know how to use it or you don't hear it in a way that's trans translates to people's ears, then you're doomed, you know. So, it really, uh, it just takes a lot of time to um, get with a with like a workflow, you know. So, uh, you know, especially working by yourself, like I do, um, it, I run into, uh, not so much a roadblock, but I wish that I had someone to bounce off of once in a while. You know, when you're doing your own solo stuff, you kind of start to second guess some things, you know, you know, Hmm, what if I did this or what if I did this, but you have no one to ask. So you're kind of having this conversation back and forth with yourself. Then, you know, it, it's a, it's a trip, man. It's quite the process, but when you're the one recording everything and performing everything. Um, you know, there's a lot going on and uh, the technical side of it, you know, you can get hung up on that pretty easy. And so you have to kind of keep a balance of the creative elements that you're trying to pull off and then also the technical side of things. So some people can do it really well and their productions come out amazing, you know, with minimal stuff. It's amazing that, uh, 
you know, the, the tools that, that are out there today for musicians, you know, but I think the basics, knowing the, the, the pure basics of how to record from being a kid, um, you know, definitely translates into the whole new way of digital recording as well. Yeah. And I'd love to get your thoughts on not necessarily digital recording, but uh, digital streaming of music. You grew up in a time where listening to Y&T, you know, or other bands of the era as well. You had physical albums like, you know, the ones behind me, uh, CDs, cassettes, whatever you had. And there's sort of a something tangible to connect you to the music. How do you feel about things like Spotify, um, Apple Music, whatever, uh, and their influence on music today? It's a love hate, not even a love, but more leaning into the hate. Um, you know, I mean, if you're a Taylor Swift, it's great. You know, you're, you're, you can reach so many listeners if people know you're there. But the problem with it is there's so much music out because anybody can record it and put it out that no one in, in a lifetime can listen to, to as much as they want, you know? So there's a flood of it. And I think it's so oversaturated and that's what was great about um, record labels. And I'm not saying, you know, Hey, I know record labels are just a bank, man. It's taken out a loan and um, it's it can, can always uh, go bad more times than not with a deal. But um, with, with this, the streaming thing though, man is, you know, if anyone, if there's no gatekeeper, then, and that's what, I guess that's my point is when there was a gatekeeper, it was like the cream of the crop. You know, you had to work your way into a situation to get your music heard and to the masses kind of pre-qualify, I guess, if that makes sense. So there was already some kind of vetting of what was going on. Like if you go back to 1975 or something, look at the charts and the, the new songs that were on the charts, they're all classics today. And honestly, I can't say that that's going to be the situation in 30 years from now. You know, you're not going to look back on today's music in 30 years and think, wow, what a classic. You know, it ain't going to be Elvis, man. It ain't going to be the Beatles. It ain't going to be Zeppelin. You know, I mean, it, you can go down the list, you know. Um, it's interesting when you think of it like that. And, and all due to because anybody can put out music today so with these streaming services you know they're the ones making the money big labels are making the money um the little artists like me um you know when i put out a single i don't expect anyone to listen to it i'm doing it for me honestly i just love to create but hey if 50 people hear it man right on cool but you know i think that there's a way that um if you could funnel the music a little better with the streaming service stuff. So it's not just some just big hodgepodge of just, I don't know, man, it's, it's really overwhelming. And when people bitch about the, Oh, well, we're not getting paid. We're getting paid, you know, fraction of a cent and all that. Well, you know, devil's ad advocate is this man is you go back to the days of CDs and vinyl records. They buy your music one time you get paid once. But at least with the streaming service, you are getting paid, you know, multiple times that someone listens to your stuff. So depending on how big your name is and how uh, effective your music is, is being marketed and all that kind of thing, then you could probably make a decent living, you know. So there's a it's a double edged sword, man. There's a lot going on there. And I honestly think that, um, you know with vinyl resurgence and all that. I mean, as you can see behind me, I've got vinyl. I've got, you know, I, I when I want to hang out, chill, man, I put on some vinyl. It's just got, got a good feel to me. I know a lot of guys hate flipping records, but I don't mind. <laughs> but then again, you know, the, the, uh, the streaming and, and the convenience of it too, you know, the portability and all that stuff. That's great. You know, there's, there's good and bad with everything, man. But, uh, you know, We'll see where it goes, man. I I don't know. Maybe kind of have this feeling that people kind of miss or they see the nostalgia of it. But the younger generation, too, sees something as, a, as wow, well, what's going on over here? Because we've already done this streaming thing for so long. This is all that most people know. So when they look back at another medium in a physical realm, you know, it depends on the person, I guess, honestly. 
It's a difficult thing. I mean, I have my radio show, The Rock Mine, and I discover a lot of artists through Spotify and Apple Music and that type of thing. But it can also be very difficult because um, it is very saturated. You know, there are so many artists out there. But, you know, what I have in my head, the sound that I have in my head, uh, it's hard to find those artists that match that, you know, especially going to maybe a more 70s, 80s rock inspired sound. So especially when looking for new artists, it can be very difficult because they're a little buried. I guess everyone has the tools now. There's no gatekeeper, like you said. And how old are you? I'm 21. No. Okay. Well, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, people at 21 years old like you um, <laughs> when, when it comes to... Uh, especially this type of music that we're talking about, you know, rock music. Um, you know, they always said even way back, you know, rock, rock is, is dead and whatever, you know, rock will never die. Rock music will always be around, I think. But, um, you know, for, for uh, your generation, um, you know, there's, I don't know about you, but I don't meet too many people that, that know, you know, if you said, uh, uh, well, you're wearing that Def Leppard shirt that you got from Target. Uh, can you name three Def Leppard songs? You know, and the 23 year old would probably say, well, pour some sugar on me. And then they probably stop there. You know, I mean, that's I guess. It's a trip, man, when you think about it, because if these people that are sporting a shirt. And they know one song. If they only dug in a little deeper, they'd find such great music that would probably take them to an, another band in kind of the light, same liking and down that road, you know, instead of, I guess, uh, you know, whatever's pop flavor of the day, you know, that their buddies are listening to at school or what, you know, I don't know, man. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I guess it's like it's kind of a good thing in some ways that these rock bands are getting exposure. Like it's kind of cool that you can walk into a store and buy a Def Leppard shirt. But at the same time, it's I don't know. I feel like like what you were saying, there are very few people who dig a little deeper, at least in my generation, who dig a little deeper and say, oh, wow, this is actually pretty cool. You know, so it just becomes a T-shirt, a Nirvana T-shirt or a Def Leppard T-shirt or whatever it is. And it just becomes a logo. And logos are cool. I mean, you know, I love, you know, the logos of Van Halen, Y&T, you know, Kiss, whoever it is, you know, it kind of loses the the meaning of what it actually is, I think. Yeah, it kind of waters it down, cheapens it, um, you know. But hey, you know, if if I owned the Def Leppard logo, I'd be selling it at Target too on a t-shirt, you know, so <laughs> more power to them. Dude. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's a that's definitely a fair point. You know, in the 80s, there was MTV. There was no TikTok. Um, were you influenced by MTV at all? Absolutely. You know, when, I mean, I remember the day it came on the air. You know, that was a big deal. And I, I don't even think we had cable. I had to go to a buddy's house or something. That his, his parents had the cable going on. And, and I just remember there was probably maybe 15 videos tops and they would just loop them. They just keep playing the same ones. Iron Maiden. It was Rothschild, Iron Maiden, uh, Pat Benatar, like, uh, what was it? Treat Me Right or something. Um, uh, you know, I, I, there, I can't think right now, but I guess point being is when you start to when, when I was seeing the visuals with the music, you know, of course, man, that was that was cool shit. That was life changing again, man. You know, I'm lucky. I grew up in a, in a really good time period for music, you know. I mean, I'm like the Archie Bunker guy now, but uh, I'm just really happy that 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 time period, you know, had such great music and just the whole vibe of everything with it, man. It's really cool. I'm lucky. Speaking about the 80s, I guess uh, after I found Black Tiger, I think the next album that I really dug into was contagious i specifically remember i was walking back i think from a calculus exam or something like that but i remember walking past my dining hall on my college campus and i listened to contagious and then i listened to the next song next song next song and i just fell in love with that album is there anything about contagious or the album 10 too um that you really appreciate i got into contagious when it first came out um what i liked about contagious was the production at that time, I know a lot of people would probably stomp all over it and just be like, oh, that's crap. Because, you know, it had bigger like reverb drums and stuff. But that was the times, man. That was that was the period of that kind of sound. Um, but I just remember I had it on cassette and it was the best sounding cassette that I had that would, you know, that I could play. 
And so I would play the shit out of it because it sounded so good. Um, and with 10, I didn't get into 10 until much later. Uh, well after the record had been out for years. Um, but there's some such great songs on 10. The whole record is, is incredible. Yeah, I love that record. And we try yeah, to yeah. throw in Hard Times, Lucy. Um, what else is on there? Uh, City is one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, and like I said earlier, man, it's hard to to um the name a bad song in a YNT in the YNT catalog. Yeah. You know, I think, I think they're all great. I'd like to bring up Gene Simmons. He has some really powerful songs from the eighties period. I'm thinking specifically of songs like Rock and Roll Hell, Not for the Innocent, On the Eighth Day, Creatures Lick It Up era. Were you drawn in by his voice at all, his vocals versus Paul's contrasting vocals? And as a singer, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I think Paul was at his peak at, in, in a lot of those records in the non-makeup. Some of the stuff Paul was doing, it was so up there, man. I mean, he must have been, he had to have been thinking like, if I do this and if I last another 20 years, how am I going to do this? <laughs> I don't know, man. I uh, that, That's a hard call because there was so many like one in a million off of Lick It Up. It's a great Paul song. Um, who wants to be lonely off of asylum incredible so is it fair and, to say that you lean more into the the paul songs of that era or do you like both equally you know paul and gene i you know what i probably lean a little more into paul's hmm. songs in that in that era but gene had you know you got a uh, i love it loud you know you got killer you know i mean creatures on on i mean I, I would say for creatures, Gene's Gene songs are my favorite off of Creatures. If I took it album by album, that'd be a lot easier. But we can't go down that road. We don't have enough time. So I mean, I had seen Y and T like I had said at the Chance Theater, which is it was I should say now a smaller club. Um, I'm sure you've played on tons of different stages. Do you have a preference for smaller venues versus playing on bigger stages, cruises? Um, what stages do you have the most fun on? I like uh, good sized theaters. Theaters are, are fun because you can still see people, um, you know, and, and yeah, small clubs are cool too. You know, the, the big stuff, you know, uh, kind of washes for me, just kind of washes over you. You know, you're just kind of looking out at, at just a sea of just vastness of people, which is so cool, but um, to make some eye contact or, you know, just, just, being able to engage a little more, you know, but when you got a railing that's 20 feet, you know, out and the people are behind that, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of weird. But then at the same time, you know, you can be playing a small club and people are leaving their drinks all over the stage and you're kicking shit over. So, you know, it just depends, man. I guess it depends on the mood really. So I'd like to talk just to sort of wrap up here. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about YNT and your solo stuff. Will we see YNT in the Northeast U S anytime soon? Do you think? I can't answer that question because never say never. Okay. <laughs> but but I, I was uh, informed that quite possibly no, that oh. uh, those sort of U.S. options right now um, are not happening. So are you guys, I know you guys were playing in Europe, right? Yeah. And actually we leave for Japan next week. I'm mm -hmm. uh, flying out on, on Wednesday for two shows in Tokyo, but, uh, we're, you know, doing, uh, the UK and Europe in the fall. And we got a lot of regional stuff going on, but there's really no plans to do a full U S run. And for yourself, will you continue playing, uh, your acoustic shows? Uh, you're, are you pretty much local to California with those shows? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty regional. I'll, I'll jump over into uh, Nevada once in a while. Okay, cool. Yeah. And can we expect some more solo songs from you as well? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I didn't even really intend on putting out this, this keep my dreams alive single. Um, Cause I just put out a sa new single in July mm -hmm. um, called Bahia sunshine. So, you know, four months later, I put out another one. That's kind of not my, my usual, but um, I had that song sitting around for a little while and it was just a matter of just getting it recorded keep my dreams alive i'm talking about uh is 
it was just I had it it was arranged it was ready to go i just had to record it and get the instrumentation down and then you know get the vocals down um and then it happened pretty quick so that's how i ended up even putting that thing out i, I probably would have sat on it for longer but i thought well what am i waiting for you know so i just threw it out there really um i I didn't do any interviews or anything for it. You're the only person I've actually even talked to about it. Um, you know, besides uh, reaching out to my close industry people, you know, friends uh, that I gave them the track, you know, prior and, and, you know, they, they support it and stuff, but, um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm glad I, I got it out. I think it's a song that lyrically, I think, you know, people need to, to hear a little more positivity around uh, what's going down in the world, man. And I think this song kind of encaps encapsulates, you know, uh, some sort of uh, uh, feeling of hope and, and looking forward and uh, living, living better. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Aaron Lee.com. If you want to uh, check out, my music and all my acoustic dates are always on there. Um, and then yntrocks.com. And that's Y-A-N-D-T rocks.com for YNT dates. And uh, yeah, so check out Keep My Dreams Alive. And thanks for having me on, Nick. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for Aaron. Really appreciate you joining us today. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, man.